Hello to all of my comic book geeks, Dante D here, and welcome to the channel, the podcast where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. We would not have anything to talk about really if it wasn't for the comic book medium and some of the most iconic characters that have come out of comic books. Without the following comic books that I'm going to be talking about today, everything about geekdom and superheroes and things, characters in movies like the Avengers and and movies that are even put out by DC, like the Justice League, all of these things would not exist if it weren't for the following comic books. Now, again, this is very subjective. This is very personal, obviously. What I consider to be a, an iconic comic book, again, would might be different for you. I don't know. But overall, I think many collectors and many fans of this medium would agree that the, the books on this list were significant to this medium. If you disagree, please let me know. And of course, at the end of this episode, I would love to hear from you all and let me know what you think are some of the most iconic books of all time. Now, what I mean by iconic is cultural significance, okay? These books might not even have the best art, okay? Uh, they are just culturally significant because of the mark they left on the comic book world. Maybe there was a death or the first appearance of a character or it was just a comic that really kind of shook the medium. So let's start off with our first book. I think I, we have about maybe almost 50 on the list and I'll try to get through them as quick as possible. Uh, and if you're listening to this as a podcast, um, I'm sorry you don't have the visual. I encourage you to check out the video version of this as well at some point. But uh, if you're a huge fan of the medium, you probably, you will know these books. <laughs> so starting off with the first one, which is probably the most famous comic book of all time, and that is Action Comics number one, which is the first appearance of Superman. We don't, I cannot underscore how important this book was to the comic book medium because this was the birth of a genre. This was a, the birth of the superhero genre and the whole superhero archetype. Every single superhero that exists nowadays in some shape or form is related to Superman. Sorry if you hear my cat in the background. He's trying to get into, into the room and he misses me. He misses me. By the way, my cat's name's Loki. <laughs> no, look, listen to him cry. <laughs> Not to mention that this is probably also the most collectible, probably the most sought after comic book of all time and one of the most expensive as well. Like just unbelievable that this book just in 2014, a 9.0 of this book sold for $3 million. That is just unbelievable. Of course, following cl uh, closely behind Action Comics number one would be the first appearance of Batman, which was in Detective Comics 27. And Batman today is probably, I, I would argue, I would say he and Spider-Man are the most popular superheroes of all time, more so than Superman. Uh, Batman, there's just a lot more you could do with the character because he doesn't have powers and he's dark and mysterious and he's great. He's not a Boy Scout, right? So... Uh, I mean, what is there not to love about Batman? Batman is actually my personal favorite. Uh, I think some of the best stories done in comic books uh, come out of Batman comics. So, obviously, the first appearance of Batman would be a uh, a must for this list. And I just love this cover. It is art by Bob Kane. I'm not a really huge fan of, of Bob Kane, especially what he did to kind of screw over Bill Finger, but um, that's, again, a topic for another video, uh, another episode uh, of the podcast as well. Actually, we did a video on the channel about how Bob Kane screwed over Bill Finger, and we actually 
did a live stream where we interviewed Bill Finger's granddaughter, Athena Finger, and we talked uh, at great length about uh, Bill Finger and really encourage you to check that out if you get the chance. All-Star Comics number eight. This is the first appearance of Wonder Woman, and I just love this cover with um, all of these uh, Golden Age DC Titans on the front. We have like Hawkman, we have the Spectre, uh, Doctor Midnight. Like some of these characters aren't even don't even exist anymore. But uh, it's a great cover, and this is the first comic that gave us uh, Wonder Woman, who is a huge, huge titan for DC Comics. Superman number. One, why is this significant? Well, this is the first Superman solo title, actually. And I think this is also the first comic book to ever be dedicated to one character ever. Because all these other books that you're seeing, like Detective Comics, Action Comics, these were all anthology books. In the golden age. So in action comics number one. You had a short Superman story. That was maybe I don't know. Maybe eight pages or something. But then the the stories that followed. Were about other characters. Like uh, I know in action comics number one. Was also the first appearance of a character named Zatara. Uh, so there were just all these different characters. Same thing in detective. Detective did not just feature Batman. It featured other characters as well. As a matter of fact. Detective Comics number one didn't even have anyone like Batman. These were all anthology books that contained many different characters. Now you have Superman number one. You have many. It's still an anthology book. You have, I think, maybe four different stories that appeared in uh, in Superman number one. But these were four different stories that all dealt with Superman. So I this was never done before. A whole book dedicated to one character that is how popular the guy with the red cape became and of course following that you know it had to happen batman was just as popular pretty much at the time uh, and of course we get uh, batman number one this also is the uh, first appearance of the joker i believe it's also the first appearance of catwoman and uh, i have to say overall golden age writing is really bland. Uh, I find Golden Age comics really boring to read because the stories are really crude. They're to the point. There's there isn't a lot of psychological richness in them whatsoever. But uh, I have to say these early Batman stories were actually really fun to read. And the first appearance of the Joker, uh, the very first story that you read in Batman number one is the first appearance of the Joker. And the story, I have to say, for the Golden Age, it was really kind of ahead of its time. And super, super entertaining story where the Joker is uh, robbing diamonds from all these rich people. And he's going on the on the radio to announce that he's going to be doing it. Like, such a classic story. And it's kind of been uh, reworked and retold in, in different ways uh, and, and referenced to in so many different books. Uh, if, if there are some of you out there that have uh, read... Uh, Batman, uh, The Man Who Laughs, which is a uh, an original Joker graphic novel, they actually uh, reference this, uh, this, this first appearance of the Joker in that book, and it was just great. Uh, Scott Snyder, in the Death of the Family run, he references characters from this issue as well. It's just, this is such an iconic issue, and it's so important to the Batman mythos. Marvel Comics, number one. Now, uh, Marvel Comics did not become the titan in the comic book industry that it is today until the 1960s. But uh, this is still, nevertheless, a very important comic book because, of course, it is an iconic cover, but it also features the first appearance of uh, the Human Torch, who at the time was not Johnny Storm, member of the Fantastic Four, Fantastic Four actually didn't exist at the time whatsoever, but the Torch did, and uh, I think he was a uh, he was some sort of like a crime fighting android 
Uh, but then we also had uh, Namor, the Submariner, in uh, in this book. So I think I also see Kazar there too. Um, Kazar is another pretty cool character that Marvel did some stories with in it later on in the 70s. And um, really cool character. I actually really like Kazar uh, myself. I actually didn't know he was in this book. Look, I learned something new today too. <laughs> Captain America Comics number one. If you're listening to this as a podcast, uh, I'm sure you're picturing the cover of this book in your head right now. Next to Action Comics number one, I think this is probably the most uh, iconic cover from the Golden Age, just because of the uh, the cultural context. Uh, that this book is coming from. I mean, all these characters are appearing around the time of World War II. So clearly, this cover would have such an effect on the comic book culture. You have Captain America, Steve Rogers, his first in his first appearance, punching Adolf Hitler in the face. Uh, and I think this is even before America entered the war. This book, uh, launched, I believe it was in 1940. And, uh, I think America joined the war not too long after. So, uh, it's incredible that the comic books and the comic book industry, they were fighting the war before the actual American soldiers were. So really, really incredible. And, uh, I think, just the the symbolism behind this cover and uh you know the fact that world war ii was such a uh how can i put it important <laughs> such an important happening in the in the 20th century i, I mean this just sum, sums up uh, a lot the, the 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 early part of the 20th century uh perfectly right so definitely amazing Flash Comics, number one. This is the first appearance of the Flash. Uh, not, he's now obviously he looks a little different. He looked a little different back then. I think with the Flash, they were trying to um, uh, copy the uh, the Greek mythological character Hermes, uh, and um, just a really kind of a cool character design. Now, obviously, if we had this Flash nowadays. He would look kind of dated, but uh, I think at the time it worked, and uh, and he definitely became a uh, huge character uh, for DC Comics. This is All American Comics number sixteen, and uh, this is the first appearance of the Green Lantern. And believe it or not, this is one of the most sought after books from the Golden Age. I mean, I know Green Lantern's a popular character, but I didn't think he was so popular to the point that this would be one of the most expensive comic books coming out of that age. Like, uh, I think this is the third most expensive comic book coming out of the golden age. So, uh, I think that's really kind of amazing. I know he didn't get fair treatment in the, in the movies. His, his movie with Ryan Reynolds was just not great at all, but Ryan Reynolds definitely has made a, uh, a great comeback <laughs> for sure. Pep Comics, number 22. This is the first appearance of Archie Andrews from the famous Archie Comics. Uh, and Archie, to this day, is an integral part of our culture. You see Archie whenever you go to the grocery stores. He's actually the only character that is still on the newsstands, uh, which is which is pretty astounding. But uh, I cannot underscore Archie Andrews' importance in our culture, for sure. Uh, on this cover here, uh, it's really kind of incredible because you don't even see Archie on the cover. It's uh, it's the S.H.I.E.L.D. who is uh, who's on the cover of this comic. But nevertheless, it's the first time that Archie made his appearance in comic books. Crime Suspense Stories... Number 22. This is Frederick Wortham's favorite, favorite comic book. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and uh, I mean that sarcastically. Uh, so this comic book here, nothing really um, in particular happens in the book that is of note uh, from a narrative perspective. But uh, if you look at the cover, it is uh, a man holding presumably his wife, uh, his wife's head after he's uh, beheaded her. And uh, this is such an iconic comic book because uh, if you know a little bit about comic book history, uh, the 1950s was an era where there was kind of a witch hunt against comic books. Uh, there was a psychiatrist by the name of Frederick Wortham uh, who believed that juvenile delinquency was a direct result of children reading comic books. And he cited and actually showed this comic book to a uh, Senate subcommittee uh, that was discussing the effects of comic books on youth. He, he used this as an example saying like, really like this is uh, this is wholesome literature that our kids should be reading. And William Gaines, who was the publisher of EC comics and pretty much started this whole new trend in crime and horror comics. They questioned him and asked him if he thought that this cover was in good taste. And he said, yes, I do believe it is in good taste. And he basically said it wouldn't be in good taste if they drew the head with blood dripping from it. <laughs> I, I, I just think it's a great story. Actually, a uh, friend of mine who I've had on many of our live streams here, Eric Breen, actually has this book and he showed it on one of our live streams. And I think this is just uh, such a legendary book. Would love to have it in my collection, but it's a little bit outside of my price range. Detective Comics 31. This is just probably one of the most iconic comic book covers of all time. And it just kind of... Uh, it really kind of show this image here really embodies what Batman is all about. He's a dark Avenger of evil. And for that reason, I think this book has become one of the most sought after by collectors. This cover actually has been swiped so many times by, by artists, most notably Neil Adams and I believe it was detective or sorry, uh, Batman number two twenty seven from the 19, 19- 70s and if you're a huge comic book fan uh you'll know it's it's pretty much an upgraded version of this cover but definitely pays homage to it actually a pretty great issue issue too um i have uh, all of these issues collected in trade so uh, a lot of fun to read like i said batman is the only golden age character i can actually read and somewhat enjoy <laughs> Detective Comics number 38 is the first appearance of Robin. And uh, Robin started this, this whole trend of teenage sidekicks. So why teenage sidekicks to begin with? Well, teenage sidekicks uh, were a way for the comic book industry to incorporate characters in their books that children could identify with a little bit more. Stan Lee actually hated teenage sidekicks and clearly never included them in any of his books, but publishers tried to capitalize on the success of Robin by including teenage sidekicks in their books. So that's probably one of the reasons why this is so iconic because we have our first teenage sidekick coming out of this, this issue and uh, come on, Batman and Robin, like, Everybody knows Batman and Robin. <laughs> they are just the dynamic duo, such an integral part of our culture. Showcase number four. This is the uh, first Silver Age Flash appearance. And this is actually the book that launched the whole Silver Age. We would not have the Silver Age of comics without this book. This is what... The book that started the whole superhero revival, the Silver Age, was characterized by this return to, to comic book superheroes. Because for a while, after World War II, people didn't care about superheroes anymore. Uh, the war was over. They didn't need anybody to fight their war for them anymore. So they started looking to other types of genres like westerns and teenage 
dramas and romance books and crime and horror, superheroes were not popular at all during the um, the late 40s and, and, and 50s. You know, the only superheroes that really essentially survived were Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Well, when the publishers were so limited with what they could do because of the Comics Code Authority, which kind of was created as a result of the whole Frederick Wortham debacle, uh, they were like, well, we don't know what to do, so let's uh, let's return to those uh, superheroes, see if we can kind of breathe some life back into them and see if we can make something out of that. And uh, this is pretty much the first time uh, that this happened. This was the book that started it all for the Silver Age and the return of superheroes to to comic books and showcase number 22 uh this is the first silver age appearance of green lantern as you can see he has a different costume also i should note too uh with showcase number four this is uh the flash's redesigned costume you can see it's it's sleek looks like it's more out of the atomic age uh very different from his uh hermes like outfit from the golden age uh same thing with green lantern here we have a new costume for him uh again sleek you can really tell that these heroes are coming out of the the atomic age um just ama amazing i, I lo love this art I'm not a big green lantern fan but uh I, nevertheless i think this is a great book and definitely one of the most sought after from the uh the silver age fantastic four number one the most important this is probably one of the most important books of all time uh especially on this list i mean all of these books are the most important of all time in my opinion but i think action comics number one and this book are probably the the top on this list and fantastic four number one obviously is the first appearance of the fantastic four but this is also the birth of of the Marvel Universe. This is the first time ever that readers were, were, were getting the sense that all the characters that were being published by Marvel Comics, they appeared in the same universe. And this is the first time that this was ever really done. You can kind of argue a little bit that DC was doing it, you know, with the Batman Superman team ups, but uh, it was not done to the extent that Marvel did. Um, before i mean marvel just took it to a whole new level great business decision too <laughs> in my opinion amazing fantasy number 15 okay i lied maybe this one is <laughs> another one of the most important ones next to action and and fantastic four number one but uh this is obviously the first appearance of spider-man and it's uh really kind of ironic that he appeared in what was to be the last issue of a failed science fiction magazine you know, uh, Martin Goodman, who was the publisher of Marvel Comics at the time, actually hated the idea of Spider-Man because he thought that teenagers only could be sidekicks. They could not be heroes themselves. So Stan was like, well, whatever, this book's failing anyway, so just let me do the story that I want. And turns out that uh, this character ended up being their bestseller. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man number one, clearly. Spider-Man, because he was so popular, gets his uh, his own title. And this is the first solo title dedicated to Spider-Man, which lasted a very, very long time. Uh, I don't think they relaunched Spider-Man until the 90s. And then eventually they ended up uh, resuming the original numbering. Yeah, I think 19, was it 1999 maybe they relaunched Amazing Spider-Man? But uh, anyway, at any rate, they uh, they originally, they eventually went back to the original numbering from Amazing Spider-Man number one. So from 1963 to 1990s. And uh, this book is also the first appearance of the Chameleon, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just, uh, just a great book. I uh, love that cover. Journey into Mystery number 83. This is the first appearance of 
Thor. Now, uh, Thor, as some of you might know, is not a character that Marvel created. Thor actually is a character from Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, he is the god of thunder. And uh, Marvel took that character from mythology and incorporated it into their own books. And he made his first appearance here and eventually became one of the most popular characters at Marvel to the point where uh, they included him in the Avengers. Um, he's in the Avengers movies nowadays. Uh, he, he It's actually incredible how popular this character has become because he's not the only character that Marvel has taken from mythology. I mean, Marvel also took Hercules and incorporated Hercules, who's also another mythological character, in their books. But Hercules, unfortunately, never rose to the same heights as Thor. So you had Thor in the Avengers, and then Hercules, I think he was part of a team called the Champions, um, which had um, a title back in the in the 70s. Uh, but to this day, I wonder why Hercules never became as popular as Thor. If you know a little bit about that, please uh, let me know for sure. Love to know that. Tales of Suspense, number 39. This is the first appearance of Iron Man. And as you could tell uh, on the cover, Iron Man did not have that hot rod red suit that he's known for today. He His suits uh, in, on, on the cover of Tales of Suspense 39 is more akin to something you'd see on the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. But believe it or not, I actually think I like that costume a little better. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, but uh, I don't know. That's just my opinion. But, I mean, of course, the first appearance of Iron Man is going to be one of the most iconic books. Because, I mean, to this day, uh, Iron Man is one of the most popular Avengers. And it's actually incredible what Robert Downey Jr. did for the Iron Man character. I think before he hit the screen as the character, Iron Man wasn't really the A-lister that we know him to be today. I think at the before Robert Downey Jr., he was more of a B-list character. Um, but yeah, because of those uh, MCU movies, he's definitely an A-lister now. Avengers number one. I love this cover. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite covers coming out of the Silver Age. So many, so many colors and uh, just love it. Uh, and we have, obviously, Loki on the front. Oh, my cat's looking at me now because I just called his name. <laughs> so we have Loki on the front. We have uh, Thor, Hulk, Iron Man, Ant-Man, and Wasp. Uh, great cover. But this is the first Avengers. Uh, we know today how important the Avengers are in our culture. So obviously their first appearance would be super, super iconic, right? Credible Hulk, number one. Uh, another one of my favorites from the era. This is actually a really rare book too. Uh, the original run on Hulk only lasted uh, six issues. Believe it or not, uh, didn't uh, didn't do as well as Marvel thought he would do. But uh, after six issues, he actually joined uh, Submariner. I think it was in uh, Tales to Astonish, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think that's what it was, Tales to Astonish. Uh, but it was, it was one of those uh, anthology books uh, until eventually he became popular enough that they could give him his own title again in the early 1970s. And I think Hulk resumed somewhere around like 102, Hulk, Hulk 101 or something like that. But uh, yeah, great book, great cover. And Hulk was not always green. He actually was gray. Uh, I don't think they made him green until uh, Hulk number three. If I'm not mistaken, and again, if I'm uh, if I'm saying anything incorrectly here, please feel free to correct me. Uh, I'm just kind of going from memory here. <laughs> Avengers number four. This is the return of Captain America. Up until this point, we hadn't seen Captain America since the uh, the Golden Age, um, and the first Silver Age appearance of Captain America was in Avengers number four. Great cover. Uh, you know, Cap just. 
he's coming at you jack kirby cover uh it looks like he's gonna pop out of the book like it's just so cool and it says captain america lives again like just such a cool cover um absolutely love it definitely one of the most sought after books from uh from the silver age but uh cap he is considered the first avenger right even though he's not on the cover of avengers number one but uh he is he is a titan for Marvel and one of the most popular characters. So uh, this is definitely an important book in uh, in the history of the character. Clearly, to follow is uh, Captain America one hundred, and uh, this is the first Silver Age solo title uh, for dedicated to Captain America. Very similar to the Avengers number four uh, cover with Cap kind of. You know, running out. Uh, but as you can see, it's Captain America 100. It's not Captain America number one. What they did here is uh, they just resumed the original numbering from where the Golden Age book uh, left off. And they basically ex- explained it that Captain America was frozen in ice since the end of World War II. Isn't that just incredible how back then... They would just resume uh, these books from their original numbering. They don't just relaunch with a whole new number one. And actually, there was a an interview with uh, Car- Car- Carmen Infantino that I watched, and he kind of explained why they did that. They didn't just start with a whole new number one. They would just resume with the original numbering. And their their reasoning behind that is when people saw that number. They looked at this book and thought, okay, this character is good enough to have, say, 100 issues. So let's check him out. They didn't want to make the character look like he was a brand new character that was going to maybe do well or maybe fail. They wanted to make the character look established. And I thought that was really cool because that is completely contrary to what we have today. Today, publishers will do a whole new number one. Like that, like I cannot tell you how many times Marvel and DC have relaunched their titles with whole all new number ones. So, (laughs) Amazing Spider-Man number one twenty one, super important book, very very important book. Uh, So the death of Gwen Stacy, uh, some consider this to be the end of the Silver Age, uh, because prior to this book, people didn't really die in comic books. So, uh, too many. this was the end of the Silver Age because people didn't really die in Silver Age comic books. Uh, but now we have that shift to darker stories. This is actually one of my favorite books of all time. Have it in my collection. So happy to have it. And uh, yeah, very powerful issue. Um, some some readers at the time who were obviously around uh, when this book came out were actually comparing this to their, calling it their Kennedy assassination moment. <laughs> so uh Really, really cool to think that uh, a comic book can have that much effect on uh, on somebody. Fantastic Four number fifty two. This is the first appearance of uh, the Black Panther, and I think this is a super important book. Not only because Black Panther is such an important character nowadays, but also because uh, Black Panther is the first uh, black superhero. Um, Prior to this book, most superheroes, actually all superheroes, were all white. So it's the first time that we saw a, uh, a diverse superhero um, in the pages of comic books. Now, up until the Black Panther movie came out, uh, Black Panther is another one of those characters that wasn't really considered to be an A-lister like he is today. Uh, he was actually he was a B-lister, heck, maybe even a C-lister, but... Um, now, because of the movie and the popularity of the movie, he definitely has bumped up to high B, maybe even A list. Uncanny X Men number ninety four. This is uh, hugely iconic because before Uncanny X Men ni- number ninety four, um, X Men actually was not popular. Like if I mention the X Men nowadays, everybody's heard of the X Men. Everyone loves the X Men, right? But uh, X Men wasn't always popular. Um, they, they did not become popular until Chris Claremont took over the writing duties. And this is the first Chris Claremont on X-Men. With, from X-Men 94 all the way through until, you know, 
the hundreds and hundreds. He was on X-Men for a really, really long time. And he made the X-Men what they are today. And it all started with this issue. Giant Size X-Men number one. Uh, one of the most sought after issues from the Bronze Age. Uh, and uh, this is the first appearance of the new X-Men team. So the original X-Men were uh, Jean Grey, uh, Beast, Iceman, and Cyclops. Uh, but now you have all these new characters that uh, made their appearance uh, to make the new X-Men. So they added Wolverine in this book. This isn't the first appearance of Wolverine, but I think this is definitely one of his earlier appearances. I don't know if it's his third appearance. Maybe it's his third. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's the first appearance of Colossus, first appearance of Nightcrawler, first appearance of many of these uh, well-known uh, X-Men that we know and love today. Incredible Hulk number 181. This is the closest thing that... Um, any modern comic or any really Bronze Age comic uh, will ever come to being something like Action Comics number one. Definitely a hugely sought after book. And this is the first full appearance of Wolverine. I cannot say this is the first appearance of Wolverine because then I'll have so many people yelling at me in the comments and uh, on social media saying, that's not the first appearance of Wolverine. Yeah, he had a cameo in 180, but most collectors would consider this to be the first appearance of Wolverine because it's his full appearance so uh love this book great cover one of the most memorable ever and uh wolverine has become one of the most popular heroes of our time and uh it all started here making it probably one of the most iconic books of all time x-men number 101 it's the first appearance of the phoenix and uh x-men is known for that phoenix phoenix storyline uh, when people think X-Men, they think the Phoenix. And uh, this is Chris Claremont work, obviously. And uh, to this day, we will always remember the Phoenix. Phoenix has made appearances in movies. Like Whenever they do X-Men on screen or anything with the X-Men, the Phoenix always comes up um, at one point or another. So uh, just really memorable work here. Then, of course, we'd have to have the death of the Phoenix, which happened in X-Men number 137. So, 36 issues later, they kill off the Phoenix, and subsequently Jean Grey. Now, she stays dead for a very long time, but eventually they do <laughs> bring her back. Uh, great issue. Uh, if you haven't read it, I definitely would uh, recommend it. But, uh, yeah, uh, this just completes that whole Phoenix storyline that the x-men are known for star wars number one this is the first ever star wars comic book uh first time we see star wars in print as a comic and uh this book saved marvel comics the late 70s was a tough time for comic book publishers marvel and dc both and uh star wars is what saved marvel comics Actually, I think Star Wars outsold Amazing Spider-Man at one point, which is which is huge. So uh, the fa and, and we can't underscore Star Wars' uh, popularity in our pop culture nowadays. I'm a, I myself am a huge Star Wars fan, as as you all know. So uh, definitely a great book. And uh, those early Star Wars stories, again, they're 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 kind of dated by today's standards, but uh, they're really enjoyable and classic, nevertheless. So definitely one of the most iconic books of all time. Green Lantern, Green Arrow, number seventy six. This is the famous Black Skins issue. Now, Green Lantern, Green Arrow um, is a book that is really well known from the nineteen seventies. This is a um, Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams uh, work, and uh, Denny O'Neill was a, a well-known hippie uh, and he really wanted to call a lot of uh, attentions attention to social issues at the time and uh, Green Lantern Green Arrow was his uh, his avenue for doing that and uh, this is the first issue that started this whole socially relevant Green Lantern Green Arrow and uh, 
one of the most reprinted panels in comic books comes from this, and that is the um, the famous Black Skins panel, wherein you see a, a black man who's pretty much gone through hell, and he says to the Green Lantern, well, you know, you've done so much for the orange skins and the purple skins on these planets, but uh, what have you done to for the black skins, Mr. Green Lantern? And, uh, and he's like, I, I have nothing to say to that. Like, I, I haven't done anything. And he's and he's ashamed of himself. And the following issues deal with, you know, overpopulation and, uh, and pollution and religion and, and drugs and the famous drug issue as well. It's another notable one. I don't think I have it on this list, but the famous, famous drug issue with a speedy um, Green Arrow's war shooting up on the cover. Like, I mean... Uh, another hugely significant book from the era. Unfortunately, though, people didn't really want to read about social relevance, and the book uh, was canceled. I think by by issue one hundred, it was canceled. So, um, didn't pe- people didn't really want to be preached to? Unfortunately, <laughs> Batman two twenty seven. Uh, this is the cover swipe that I was talking about earlier on in the in the episode uh, of um, Detective Comics 31. This is just a really notable cover from the era. This is Neil Adams' work, cover swipe, and highly collectible, definitely, and highly sought after by collectors. Wolverine number one. Uh, now, Wolverine was a... Uh, became a juggernaut in the Marvel Comics world, and in the comic book world in general, very, very quickly to the point where he made his, first, he made his debut in 1975. And uh, I think by the 1980s, early 1980s, he's getting his own title. Uh, now, mind you, this was a limited series. It only lasted four issues, but this is uh, Chris Claremont and Frank Miller work. Highly recommend reading it if you haven't. But uh, it's the first time that uh, Wolverine gets his own title. And then a few years later, he actually got his own ongoing series. So... That was Wolverine Volume 2, number 1, with him standing over all these dead bodies. Dark Knight Returns. Uh, This is one of the most seminal works in comic books of all time, and definitely deserved a spot on this list. Uh, And I call this the birth of Batman as we know him. Uh, Now... We could say that Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams made an effort to return Batman to his darker roots in the 1970s, especially after the campy portrayals that we got in the 60s with the uh, with the Adam West um, Batman TV show. But I don't think the Batman as we know him today, that the dark Avenger of uh, of evil, you know, I don't think we saw him until. Dark Knight Returns. I mean, the seventies Batman. Yeah, he was he was a little he was a little dark, but you know he was really slender, and he kind of at times reminded me of like the Roger Moore James Bond. I know I've said this before. Um, just wasn't really how I picture Batman, but the way I picture Batman is definitely how Frank Miller portrayed him in the Dark Knight Returns, and I think in This book, Frank Miller created a new template for the Dark Knight that carries on into our our time today. Uh, I mean, this book was just so ahead of its time. It's it's just incredible. So definitely, if you haven't read this, go out and get it. It's, It's amazing. And of course, Watchmen. Redefine the comic book industry. So, uh, I, I, if, if Dark Knight redefined Batman and gave us a new template for Batman. I think Watchmen redefined the comic book industry because prior to this point, uh, the comic book industry had, was fighting against this stigma of comic books being just for kids. Uh, I mean, heck, this is a stigma that to a certain extent still exists today, but uh, Watchmen is the comic book that showed us that comic books are mostly not for kids anymore. And Alan Moore, what he did with the the superhero genre here is just incredible. He unpacks the idea of what a superhero is and tries to envision them in our real world. 
I mean, because come on, if you want to put on a costume and go fight evil and go fight crime, I mean, there's got to be something wrong with you mentally, right? So uh, I think he really kind of delves into that quite a bit with this book. And uh, it's it's kind of um, satirical commentary on the comic book industry in a sense, even though it's a very dark work. And, and again, redefined the comic book industry as being more for adults. This is actually the only comic book that Time listed on their top 100 novels of all time. So definitely um, deserves to be on this list. Batman, the killing joke. And uh, this is the birth of the Joker as we know him. Uh, you know, the the Joker went through many iterations throughout his, uh, you know, 80-year history. And uh, the Joker that we know today, I feel, uh, was born in the killing joke. One of my favorite Batman comics, one of my most favorite Batman comics of all time. And uh, highly recommend to add this to your collection if uh, if you do not have it or have not read it. Uh, this is the psychopathic Joker that we know and love today, uh, and uh, and Alan Moore really redefined the Joker for a new generation. Batman four twenty eight. It's the death of Robin. Uh, this is the first comic book I think that ever got media attention. Um, People just went nuts when they found out Robin died. Now, they thought it was the Dick Grayson Robin. Uh, they didn't know it was the um, uh, Jason Todd. <laughs> His name slipped my mind for a second. Sorry. The Jason Todd Robin. Uh, and um, again, crazy. And I th and I really like what uh, DC did with, uh, with this book. Um, they actually let the fans decide if Robin was going to die or live with this 1900 number that they had at the the back clearly people voted for him to die because uh not a lot of people liked jason todd new mutants 98 first <clears throat> new mutants 98 is the first appearance of deadpool uh and deadpool is a huge huge titan huge juggernaut in uh the comic book world and in pop culture today and this is the first time he ever made an appearance uh great book very highly sought after very expensive uh but uh, collectors just go nuts for it amazing spider-man 300 first appearance of first full appearance of venom uh because he of course he made a cameo in 299 but um the uh the first full venom was in amazing spider-man 300 wow what a book this was and heck wow what a character venom is and uh it all started here x-men number one this is the jim lee chris claremont x-men uh from 1991 uh this is a record selling comic book i think every single person watching this that collects comic books probably has this comic in their uh collection but uh it is worth it uh i thought great story i personally love it and loved it <laughs> Uh, and, um, yeah, not very expensive book and you should be able to add it to your collection rather cheaply if, uh, if you don't have it, but, uh, every comic book collector needs to have this in their collection. It's a record seller. Okay. It is estimated that 8 million copies of this book sold. Now, mind you, I know those numbers are probably not super accurate because people were buying multiple copies and you know you had all these special edition covers and variant covers and whatever whatever but at the end of the day a comic book up until this point had never sold that many copies ever not even in the golden age so it's pretty astounding spawn number one i think this is a hugely iconic comic book because uh, i don't think there exists any independent character today that is as popular as spawn todd mcfarlane created spawn and uh this book here alone as an independent comic sold over a million copies like nowadays that's unheard of like no independent comic is going to sell uh, hell an independent comic would be even lucky to sell what fifty thousand copies nowadays uh hot books nowadays sell a hundred thousand copies so uh i mean wow uh Todd McFarlane did well with himself with this character. I personally love Spawn. I'm a huge fan. Um, I have it in my collection. I have the trades. Um, 
great character. Love reading Spawn. And, uh, you know, like I said, I think this is a, a hugely important comic book because it's the first time that an indie comic book I, I broke through that glass ceiling of, uh, of comic book corporatism. So, great milestone here. Amazing Spider-Man number 361 is the first appearance of Carnage. Uh, another huge character uh, villain, sorry, uh, coming out of the uh, 1990s. Love Carnage. Uh, just made recently made a, an appearance in a Venom movie. And Carnage is just one of the most beloved villains coming out of Marvel. And he made his first appearance in 361. And definitely this is uh, one of the most sought after comics coming out of the 90s. Batman number 497. This is the famous breaking of the bat issue. Now, in the 90s, the 90s is known for comic book companies trying a lot of these gimmicks to uh, increase the perceived collectability of their comics. Um, this is one of the gimmicks that was uh, was was tried. And uh, it was successful. This book did rather well. Story-wise... One of my favorite Batman storylines of all time. I love Batman Nightfall. It was this, this huge, like, maxi series. I think, what was it, 20 issues, maybe? Uh, great, great, great story. Uh, loved it. And uh, if you haven't read Nightfall, check it out. Uh, to this day, this is one of the most memorable Batman stories uh, coming out of the Batman mythos, period. And definitely one of the most memorable stories coming out of the 90s. And of course, we have the death of Superman, Superman 75. This is a 3 million copy seller right now. People went nuts uh, when Superman died, and they thought that for sure that he was going to stay dead forever. My, how those people were foolish. And you know for sure they were not comic book fans because true comic book fans know that people in comic books, especially huge corporate characters like Superman, never stay dead i think they actually kept them dead for maybe about a year and then clearly they brought them back um people went nuts over the death but when they finally brought them back nobody cared <laughs> uh death of superman actually believe it or not is one of my favorite superman runs uh but to a lot of collectors and a lot of people they they tend to ignore it because they feel that the death of superman is everything that was wrong with comic books in the 1990s and they actually kind of blame this comic for for you know the bursting of the collector's bubble and the crash of the comic book market because like i said when he came back no one cared and there were all these unsold copies of the return of superman right so um yeah but nevertheless this book this the, the this was a media circus uh with this book and just went nuts. Like there were people that legitimately thought they were going to be able to retire for, off of this book or be able to put their kids through college. Like if you go on YouTube right now and search Death of Superman news reports, you will find news reports of uh, like there's this one lady that's like, you know, I'm going to put my baby through college with this. Like it's it, it's nuts. Uh it's ludicrous that people thought this, but uh nevertheless, it happened and uh if you could ignore all of the hype around this book, and you just read it for the story. It's great. My favorite Superman story of all time. And that's about it. Uh, th that's my list. Uh, as you can see, I don't have any books from uh, the the modern era here, just because um, I'm not a huge fan of the modern era, and I don't really think that any books in the last like, 20, 25 years really... Uh, left their mark on the industry quite like say a book like the death of superman but uh that's my list if you feel like i left out any any books uh please let me know i would really like to hear what some of the books that you feel uh are the most iconic love to hear from you all please reach out to me in the comments or reach out to me on social media always love interacting with you as always thank you so much for joining me here weekly love talking comic books and other geek stuff with you all the time. Till next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode.